everyone. My name is Jeffrey. Welcome to my talk about introduction to web systems. Now, who of you guys have worked with a front end or back end? You don't have to. Okay, good. So we'll start from scratch and we'll go through everything you need to know. At the end, you're not necessarily going to be able to sit down and write up your own web system. That takes a lot of work, that takes a lot of learning. I'm going to tell you where to start, what's important, what you need to know, and what you should focus on and how to learn. So we're going to go over a couple of things today. First things first, we're going to go over domains. Most of you guys probably know what domains are. Uh, it's google.com or facebook.com or whatever weird name you want to call your project. If you make that a website, you need to go through a domain. We're going to be talking about HTTP ingress. You probably haven't heard of this, but it's basically a, a rule set for talking over the internet to different devices. This is actually how you go to a website. Every time you go to a website, you're using this protocol. You just don't know it. And this is also how you get information from the web, how you change it, how you make it, and how you it. So we'll go into the details of how that actually works. Uh, after that, we're going to talk about actual web systems. So this is mostly the communication part, which is super important, because you can have 10, 10 components that are all super advanced, but they're useless if you can't connect them together. So we're going to talk about what part everything makes. And this is when we're actually going to start talking about front end, back end, and what I think you should use. And then we're going to go into technology, which again, like I said, what you're going to use is what to learn and what not to learn. Any questions so far? Great. If you guys have any questions, put up your hands, throw something at me, don't be afraid to stop me. There's lots of time for questions. All right. So let's start at the beginning. When you go to a website, let's say I type in facebook.com in my web browser. What's actually happening? What you see is that you type enter, it loads, and then all of Facebook comes up. You see that website. You see the interface, you see the buttons, you see the text. And on that website, you can click on it. You can navigate things, you can put in your name. So starting with your domain. So if I type in facebook.com on my computer, then it goes to some specific IP address. Have you guys heard of IP addresses? Yes? No? Okay, that's not too bad. An IP address, is some kind of number that identifies a device on the internet. For example, 88.67.01.85. Some random number that uniquely identifies any device on the internet. Now, if you're going to go on a router, right, if you're connecting to the internet like you are, your device actually has an IP address. So technically, if you did enough configuration, you're someone on some I don't know, other internet part in the world, maybe in Africa or China or wherever, they could go to your IP address and connect to your computer. Theoretically, of course, there's a bit of configuration to be done. So the question is, if I go to Facebook.com, and then you open up Facebook.com, maybe on, in, like when you're in Canada, how does it know that it's going to the same website? Or maybe it goes to a, it's down site. So what actually is that? We both see the same thing. There's something in between these two that's called a domain name register. So when you type in facebook.com, something called a domain name registrar will translate that into a unique IP address. Right? That domain name registrar can be domain.com, which you guys hopefully got a few domains for, Namecheap, Dreamhost, there's a lot of different ones out there. All you have to do is register for one, you open an account, and you say, hey, I want to buy this domain, facebook.com, okay, and I want to point this domain toward this machine. Right. So that's what's happening when you open your computer and you go to facebook.com. The domain name registrar says, okay, here's your information, this URL translates to this IP, now go get that. From that machine, we go to a program, running on that program, uh, running on that machine, and that program will give us our website in HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. So do you need a domain to specifically connect to someone else's computer, or can you just put in the IP address? You can put an IP address. Good question. 
Now, the reason why we don't do that is because I don't want to remember this number. And even worse, I don't want it to change, right? So if they use Facebook.com, they can point it to whatever they like. They can point it to another server. They can point it to a coming soon page, right? Or a down to maintenance page. That gives us readability and usability, and that gives them control. Does that make sense how domain works? Any questions so far? So the IP address is a connection of two things, your router and then your device on that router. Um, so it's something, I believe it's something like this, like your router has this thing, and then any device is gonna ha have some random number tacked up. So if you go to your router configuration, like at home, you log into the admin, and you see what devices are connected, you're gonna be able to see a bunch of different addresses. Each device on the router has unique IP That's well, it could be domain as domain owner's address as well. Okay. The important thing being, there's a there's a program that runs on some computer somewhere. Doesn't matter where it is. This is the address for it. You buy a domain and you say, I want this domain to go to that. Yeah. Right. Yes. So if I go somewhere else and have a different IP address. Yes. Then you need to change this. Oh. So it's yes. So that's why it's not great to host a website on your own computer. That's why we go to something like. Yes, you know, pages, I don't know what else you guys want to host stuff on. But that's why we want to have some website provider that will take care of this machine. All we have to do is give the website, and it will give us a, an IP address which will not change. But I can also put several IP addresses on there. Uh, you, you can. There's a couple weird things where it's like, you can go to a bunch of different servers that are slightly different, and they all redirect you to the same place. It's just because um, it's just so that that website can have more stability. Um, or you can say, uh, let's say messenger.facebook.com or mobile, whatever it is. When you go to that one, then it goes to a different domain. Okay. So you can configure these things in a lot of contexts. Have a seat. Grab some water if you want. Um, does it make sense? Domains make sense? This is most of what I'm going to talk about for domain. We won't come back until the very end. Um, keep in mind that, so, so the main takeaway from this is if you want to host a website, throw it on something online, uh, Freehost or GitHub Pages, AWS, and from there you buy a domain name and you connect it to that IP address. Okay. So if I'm yes. on third party, So for example, if you're using Wix or WordPress or some other self-hosted thing, then if you go to the instructions, it'll tell you how to connect your own domain. It'll, it'll basically modify um, it to go to, like Facebook.com will go to that IP address, it'll go to Wix's main servers. Those Wix's main servers will configure it and then change it to your website. Great, okay. Next is HTTP and REST. Um, so, right just now we talked about getting a URL, getting the content from a URL. When you go to a website, you ask it for a content, and then that content comes back in HTML, CSS, JavaScript. But there's more complex ways to do this. This is a very simplified version. So let's say we're doing Facebook.com again. When we type it in the address bar, what we're actually doing is an operation called get at, at the URL of Facebook.com. This is something that's in a protocol, a rule book, a rule book for communication, that's called REST. Representational state transfer, it doesn't really matter. What matters is that it is how a lot of different devices over the internet communicate. It is how your device updates information from Facebook. If you're building a web system, it's how your front end connects to your back end, it's how you get data, it's how you retrieve user data, everything like that. It goes through this, it generally goes through this communication. So when you do get Facebook.com, you get back HTML and a bunch of different files. 
But you can also configure this to do different things. Instead of HTML, you could get back a JSON object, which is the most common one. It just it looks like a bunch of key value pairs. You can get back just standard text, nothing else. You can get back some weird file. You can get back an MP3. You could get Facebook MP3 if there's a if there's a, a audio file you want to download, and that would just give your streaming link back to the MP3. This is a super versatile operation that you can do. So every communication in REST is built of two things. One, request, and two, response. Everything has a request and response. If it does not have a request, uh, a response, it is timed out and you try again. You've probably seen this on your computers, timed out. So we'll start with the request. Every request consists of an operation, consists of a URL, and consists of a body. I'm not going to dive too much into it. You can look into what this is like uh, online. There's a lot of different resources, and I could talk about this for days on it. But this is the basic communication protocol. In a request, you have an operation, you have a URL, and you have a body. So what's an operation? An operation is what you want to do to a piece of data. There's get, there's post, there's put, and there's delete. There's also like, I don't know, 20 others, 10 others, but you don't need to know these. These are the basic ones. Get, pretty simple. You say, I want a specific resource. Whether it's a URL, a page, a piece of data, an MP. Post, I want to create the resource. Maybe you want to upload an MP. Maybe you want to create a user in your database. So you do a post request. Put request is making a change to something that's already there. I made my user account. I want to change my password. I'm going to do a put request. Delete, pretty simple. I hope I don't have to explain that one. So this is everything that goes into a and everything that goes into a response is almost the exact same thing. The only difference is that instead of the operation and URL which you're sending it to, you will get back a status code. <coughs> now in a second you guys are going to be like, oh, I get it. Because a status code is how an operation is handled. Whether it was successful, unsuccessful, something went wrong, who screwed it up. We're only going to go over like a couple. You're going to see these really often. 200, okay. Everything went fine. It did what it was supposed to. 400 bad request, which means you screwed up something and you should resend your request. Because this request is something that the back end says, you have to talk to me through this specific way. I want you to go to Facebook.com. I want you to send me, I don't know, your username, and I will give you back a profile. But let's say Facebook says you have to do these things and you forget to send a username. That's when you get a point of that request. You should fix your request and go back. If I say 404, what do you guys say? Forbidden. Not fun. Not fun. I think 3, 4, 401 is forbidden. 401 unauthorized, 403 forbidden. And 404 not found. Very common. When you go to a website that doesn't exist, let's say I actually go to this website, there's nothing there. Most websites will give you back a 404. That page does not exist. I do not have this thing that you asked for. Not found. And the final one that you need to know is 500 internal server error. What this means is something went wrong on the server. Something went wrong on whatever was giving you data. You should try again, or you should wait for the person who screwed it up, fix it. Basically, the person sending the request did nothing wrong, and no one has any idea what happened. This is basically how every system on the internet connects to each other and talks to each other. They have to follow these protocols. So now we're going to go Actually, so that's about the end of rest, and I'm going to go into 
how they actually are using web systems. Do you guys have any questions on HTTP or REST at the moment? Okay. So now you guys are going to see what actually happens. How these are used. You guys have probably heard the name front end and back. I'm going to make two systems. So let's start off. What is a front end? A front end is what the user sees, is what the user interacts with. Let's say I go to Facebook.com. The front end is the website that I'm looking at, the colors, the design, the buttons, the inputs. But when I want to input something on Facebook, let's say I want to, change, I want to create a post. When I create that post, and I go to another computer and I sign in, it has to appear on that other computer. So it has to talk somehow. REST is how those things are communicated. So the front end, that website sitting on the, the user's computer, is going to send data to the back end. And the back end is a program. That's literally it. It's a program sitting on, on a computer somewhere that someone can access. Another name for it, if you've probably heard of it, is server. Exact same thing. Backend is a server. It's a program running somewhere that someone, anyone, can talk to in a specific manner. And if they talk to it in that specific manner, they'll get back a response. So to, to go back into our example, let's say I want to create a post. On the front end, I as a user will send data across to the back end. The back end will store that data and tell me, okay. 200 okay, everything was okay, your post was created. And now someone else on the internet can go and get that data. The same way we talked about, you're just getting a resource. When it gets that resource, the back end will give it back that state. Right? This is how everything on the internet is built. Pretty much everything talks through REST protocols. There's multiple front ends. The front ends provide you with basic functionality, and the back ends handle all the data processing. Data storage, data processing, if you're doing, let's say, doing analytics, or you're doing some weird function, for example, one time, one of our applications, we had to check whether or not two things were close together. Let's say this was a super intensive process for some reason. You don't want to do it on the front end because the user's computer is going to lag, it's going to take a long time, it's going to stop. You don't know how strong the user's computer is. So you send it to the back end, it does data processing, and it comes back. And in addition, you store data. So everything is essentially centralized back end, and communicated with the front end. Examples of front end technologies include HTML, CSS, JavaScript. It includes something like React. That's something that you go to front end with, something that somebody interacts with. And in the functionality, you can go talk to a back end. Um, it also includes an Android app. So an Android app can talk to a backend server the same way that any other website can. For a backend, there's lots of different technologies. You guys have heard of Node and Express, hopefully. Um, Django, Python, uh, Golang. Golang is strictly backend. But the one I recommend for you guys is Firebase. I've done how many hackathons? Six, I think. Six hackathons so far. And the only real easy to set up and easy to use backend is Firebase. It's a Google product. It's super easy to use because you just set it up and you can send data and, re and reply to it super quickly. It's hard for anything to go wrong. You can see the data on the internet through the website. So that one's something that you guys can prototype with and make something with super quick. For the front end, I can't give you guys a single recommendation because that depends on what your application is supposed to do. Maybe it's a website that people go on and they look at restaurants. In that case, use HTML, CSS, JavaScript, or a React thing, something that helps you build some JavaScript application. Maybe you want it to be a mobile app where you're tracking the location and you want to send to someone else. Of course, then you have to use an Android app. But regardless, if you're storing data, then you need to build a backend or use some kind of backend, and the front end will communicate. You can host your backend on a number of different things. Insert for that. You 
can host your backend in a number of different things. Now, this is where the domain things come in. Your backend, if you host on, let's say, AWS, if you go on AWS and you upload go to Django, then you will get a URL or an IP address specifically. That IP address is how the front end will talk. So all you have to do is upload on AWS, you get an IP address, you give that to the front end, and you're configuring the communication protocol. And then this front end will be talking with that back end. So now all of a sudden you have something, a program running 24 seven on the internet, and if you provide a website to it on a domain. The user downloads the website essentially when they're getting it, and they'll automatically be able to access your back. The third time, the fourth time, this is how everything on the internet works. The front end that people interact with is a piece of, is a, is a hunk program sitting on the back of a website somewhere that stores all the data and does all the processing. Specific, and, um, specific types of hosts, can be AWS, super simple. Google Cloud Platform, if you guys want that free prize. But the one I want to recommend today is Heroku. I used it with some of my web projects. If you're building a backend, you should try Heroku because all you have to do is write in a single file configuration from my file to me one line. I connected it to Heroku on their website and my backend was up and running in two minutes. Two minutes. Every single time I push to my GitHub repository, that thing automatically updates and it's, in, it's, it's fixed within two minutes. Super easy to use. Um, has anyone done backend stuff before? Okay. One last thing I want to talk about here is that the backend can also connect to a database. Easy. If you have not done databases before, don't try it. It's gonna be a pain in the ass, it's not worth it. It is all, it is hell to set up, it is hell to connect, but ideally it gives you long-term storage and safe storage in case this program goes down. That's basically all the data.